This episode today is called The Jesuit Order. So in the year 1540, an order was formed by a Spanish man called Ignatius Loyola. He named the order the Society of Jesus, otherwise known as the Jesuit Order. This order was sanctioned by Pope Paul III and brought into power. So the whole purpose of the order was to destroy the Reformation in its tracks and bring all the nations back under the control of the Pope. This order was meant to be under the control of the Pope, but eventually it would become so powerful that even the Pope would be under its control. The whole goal of this order is world domination at any cost. The Jesuit order wants to control the world and everyone in it. That includes me and you. The whole purpose of this order is to bring all nations under the control of a Pope whom they control. So the organisation actually became so powerful and caused so much trouble that they were, at, they were expelled from over 83 countries through the world. So we read a quote from a Jonas E.C. Shepherd. Between 1555 and 1931, the Society of Jesus was expelled from at least 83 countries, city-states and cities for engaging in political intrigue and subversive plots against the welfare of the state, according to the records of a Jesuit priest of repute. Practically every instance of expulsion was for political intrigue, political infiltration, political for subversion, and inciting to political insurrection. And we hear about, we hear from M.F. Cusack in her book, The Black Pope. She says, the Jesuits are the only religious order under the Church of Rome. And these orders are very numerous, which has lain under the ban of the Pope, or which has been expelled from any country because of its interference in politics. Hence, we may expect to find that to obtain political power forms a main feature in the plans of the society. I'm going to read you now a part of the oath that a Jesuit has to take. This is, this is from the complete oath, oath published in 1883, and this is the ceremony of induction and extreme oath of the Jesuits. You have been taught to insidiously plant the seeds of jealousy and hatred between communities, provinces and states that were at peace, and incite them to deeds of blood, involving them in war with each other, and to create revolutions and civil wars in countries that were independent and prosperous, cultivating the arts and the sciences and enjoying the blessings of peace, to take sides with the combatants and to act secretly in concert with your brother Jesuit, who might be engaged on the other side, but openly opposed to that with which you might be connected, only that the, ch that the church might be the gainer in the end, and the conditions fixed in the treaties for peace, and that the end justifies the means. You have been taught your duty as a spy to gather all statistics, facts and information in your power from every source, to ingratiate yourself into the confidence of the family circle of Protestants and heretics of every class and character, as well as that of the merchant, the banker, the lawyer among the schools and universities and parliaments and legislatures and in the judiciaries and councils of state, and to be all things to all men for the Pope's sake, whose servants we are unto death. And the Jesuit has to repeat this. I furthermore promise and declare that I will, when opportunity presents, make and wage relentless war, secretly or openly, against all heretics, Protestants and liberals, as I am directed to do, to extirpate and exterminate them from the face of the whole earth, and that I will spare neither age, sex or condition, and that I will hang, burn, waste, boil, flay, strangle and bury alive these infamous heretics, rip up the stomachs and wombs of their women and crush their infants' heads against the walls in order to annihilate forever their execrable race. 
that when the same cannot be done openly, I will secretly use the poison cup, the strangulating cord, the steel of the poignard, or the leaden bullet, regardless of the honour, rank, dignity, or authority of the person or persons, whatever may be their condition in life, either public or private, as I at any time may be directed so to do by any agent of the Pope or superior of the Brotherhood of the Holy Faith of the Society of Jesus. So that was just a few few parts of the Jesuit oath that I read for you there. So I'm going to read you some quotes about the Jesuits talking about their power. This is from Michelangelo Tamburini, 14th Jesuit General from 1706 to 1730. And he says, See, sir, from this chamber I govern not only to Paris, but to China, not only to China, but to all the world without anyone to know how I do it. And we've got a quote here from the fiery Jesuits from an F. Doza in 1667. It says, we make war at our pleasure between one prince and another, between a prince and his subjects, usurp dominion over cities and countries, fearing no discovery of our actions, since our commerce is chiefly with great men. We know every public secret and can, in a singular way, dispatch heretics and enemies of the Roman court. And this other quote from uh, Aloysius Fortis in 1825. He was the 20th Jesuit general from 1820 to 1829. He says, You well know what we aim at as the empire of the world. But how are we to succeed unless we have everywhere adepts who understand our language, which, which must yet remain unknown to others? And I'm going to go through now, I'll go through some quotes from some other writers and other people, some you might have heard from, some you might have heard of before. So we've got a quote here from a G. Gordon Liddy, and he, was, he used to work for the FBI. He says, As much as I had admired the German Benedictines, I admired the Jesuits more. The Society of Jesus was something special. The short troop of the Catholic Church, so effective an organisation was it that Heinrich Himmler used it as a model for his own corpse of the Scastafo, these men ran the world and it was obvious that they enjoyed it. And that's from the book Will, the autobiography of G. Gordon Liddy. So he's would probably, would, most of you would have heard of, heard of this guy and that's Napoleon Bonaparte. And what he says about the Jesuits is, The Jesuits are a military organisation, not a religious order. Their chief is a general of an army, not the mere farer abbot of a monastery. And the aim of this organisation is power, power in its most despotic exercise, absolute power, universal power, power to control the world by the volition of a single man. The general of the Jesuits insists on being master, sovereign over the sovereign. Wherever the Jesuits are admitted, they will be masters, cost what it may. Every act, every crime, however atrocious, is a meritorious work, if committed for the interest of the society of the Jesuits or by the order of the general. So the next quote is from Luigi de Santis, and he was the official censor of the Inquisition. He wrote a book called Popery, Puseism and Jesuitism. What it has to say is, Thus they act pretty much everywhere. Dominion is the end at which they aim. The means for arriving at it are different, hence, in a country where there are Jesuits, they must either rule, or the country must go to ruin. And in this way, either under one name or another, it is they who rule the world. If you examine the facts, you will find that they aim at universal dominion alone. Or other words, world government. So the next quote is from a book called Rome and the War in 1916, and it's by... It's the author is called Watchman. I actually, somebody gave me a loan of this book, so they did, and I was able to go and check it over for myself. I was, I was thinking in my head it'd be great if I could actually look through this book, and somebody actually gave me a loan of it. A, a book that's a hundred years old, 
and when I spoke to somebody and said I was researching this stuff, they came in with that book. So it was quite an amazing coincidence. So from this this uh, this book, here's a quote. It was for this reason that the Jesuits, ever since the Reformation, took care to acquire the post of confessors to nearly every crowned head of Europe and to their principal ministers, for by means of the religious influence which they exercised on the rulers, they were able to control the affairs of the state, enact laws and wage wars against the Protestants and plan and carry out massacres of those who opposed them. In England, also during the reign of Elizabeth, they made the greatest efforts to overthrow the Protestant government by exciting repeated rebellions and by forming numerous plots to the murder of the Queen and her ministers. So you wonder if they were, if the Jesuits were trying to overthrow queens back then that wouldn't bow down to them. How is this? Why is this not happening today? Is it maybe because they've already infiltrated this this country? I'll leave that up to you to decide. So my next quote from M. Louis René de Caraduc, and this is in 1762. It's a report on the constitution of the Jesuits. He says, let us read the history of all the conspiracies which have ever been formed in the world. Consider the qualities which are necessary for success in such perilous enterprises, and the chiefs who dare to undertake them, the dangers they have to brave, the treasures they must expend, the pains, the care they must take to captivate the minds of the people and to excite them, and the springs they have to set in motion, both public and concealed, to affect their progress. Consider how dangerous these conspiracies have been formed or failed. You will not find one, the chief of which, after years of care, has been able to organise his forces with so little danger, with as great advantages as a general of the Jesuits could command within 24 hours. I've got another quote here from... It's a member of the French Parliament, Riquet. He says the general is the true pope of the company of Jesus and the plan of this institute is to destroy all authority and all government having concentrated all in its society. This ambitious company is a nation, a power apart, germinating in the loins of all others, changing, changing their substance and surmounting their ruins. <coughs> so the next quote from the inventor of the Morse code, Samuel Morse. He even knew about the Jesuits, he knew about their power. And he says, They are Jesuits, this society of men, after exerting their tyranny for upwards of 200 years, at length became so formidable to the world, threatening the entire subversion of all social order, that even the Pope, whose devoted subjects they are, and must be by the vow of their society, was compelled to dissolve them. They had not been suppressed, however, for 50 years, before the waning influence of popery and despotism required their useful labours to resist the light of democratic liberty. And the Pope simultaneously with the formation of the Holy Alliance revived the order of the Jesuits and all their power. From their vow of unqualified submission to the sovereign pontiff, they have been appropriately called the Pope's bodyguard. And do Americans need to be told what Jesuits are? They are a secret society, a sort of Masonic order, with super-added features of revolting audaciousness and a thousand times more dangerous. They are not merely priests or of one religious creed. They are merchants and lawyers and editors and men of any profession, having no outward badge by which to be recognised. They are about in all your society. They can assume any character, that of angels of light or ministers of darkness, to accomplish their one great end the service upon which they are sent, whatever that service may be. They are all educated men, prepared and sworn to start at any moment and in any direction and for any service commanded by the general of their order, bound to no family, community or country by the ordinary ties which bind men and sold for life to the cause of the Roman pontiff. <clears throat> and I've got another quote here and that's from Marcel de la Roche Arnold, 1827. He was a French Roman Catholic priest. 
He says, I've summoned to the bar of public opinion only a small number of Jesuits. There still remain 300 formidable members whom I've not unveiled, but whom, whom I shall unveil at a future time. They were powerful, for such was the will of kings. They assassinated princes and disturbed empires. That, the Jesuits, were the disturbers of kingdoms, the oppressors of nations, the masters of the world, I freely admit. And the last quote I've got here is, this is from Luigi De Santis again, from 1852, from his book, Popery, Pusiasm and Jesuitism. It is a certain fact that after the Council of Trent, Roman Catholicism was entirely fused into Jesuitism. Jesuitism is not very scrupulous. It knows, according to the circumstances of the times and places, how to invest itself with new forms and to appear even liberal, whilst officially it condemns liberalism. The day Catholicism is separated from Jesuitism will be the day of its death. Popery Jesuitized can only be known in its, in its reality in Rome. There alone can you learn all the subterfuges and the evil arts that they had dropped to draw all the kingdoms off the earth under the yoke of the Pope. So there again, world government. So today, the Jesuit general, he is the real ruler of the Vatican. It is he who is known in Catholic circles as the Black Pope. So the Black Pope works in the shadows while the White Pope is the face of the Vatican. So really the Black Pope rules the White Pope. So the current Black Pope is called Farah Arturo Souza. He has been a Jesuit general since four, the 14th October 2016. And the current White Pope is also a Jesuit. This is the first time this has ever happened in history. His name is Pope Francis and his full name is Jorge Mario Bergoglio. And I'm going to read from the, the Black Pope book. And this, this tells you about how it works with the Black Pope and the White Pope. So we read, in Roman Catholic circles it is well known the Black Pope is a term used for the general of the Jesuits. Those Romanists who do not, do not greatly love the Jesuits use the term to indicate the Black Pope rules the White Pope. And we've got another quote from the same book. It says, the general has usually stood towards the Pope much as a powerful grand feudatory of the Middle Ages did towards a weak titular lord paramount. And the should Roman populace have long shown their recognition of this fact by styling these two great personages, severally the White Pope and the Black Pope. In truth, the society has never from the first obeyed the Pope whenever its will and his has happened to run counter to each other's. And we've got one more quote here from the same book. And it's, the Jesuits wish to take a step towards the accomplishment of their great object of establishing a universal monarchy, world government again, with the White Pope nominally at the head and the Black Pope holding the rein. And I've got one more quote here, talking about the Black Pope and the White Pope. And that's from a FAC Lillingston in 1900. And it's from the Jesuits, what are they, who are they, what have they done, and what are they doing? It says, it is the bounding duty of, duty of every Protestant to vote at the parliamentary elections for none who favour favor the Romish apostasy, because really the whole Romish system is not governed by the Pope the infallible, but he who is now known as the Black Pope, the General of the Jesuits. <sighs> so, from the Jesuits' order, Jesuit Order's inception in 1540 up until about 1773 they had caused that much carnage through the world that the Pope actually had to abolish them with a papal bull. So we can read this through Wikipedia. It says the suppression of the Jesuits was a politically instigated removal of all members of the Society of Jesus from most of the countries of Western Europe and their colonies beginning in 1759 and ultimately approved by the Holy See in 1773. 
So, although the Pope actually abolished the Jesuits in 1773, right, they still they went underground and they were still allowed to continue on work in, in other places. Two of the countries were Prussia and Russia. So the Pope that actually the, supro the Pope that actually suppressed the Jesuits, he knew he was he was doing a dangerous thing. And what he actually said about the suppression is he says the suppression is accomplished, I do not repent of it, having only resolved on it after examining and weighing everything, and because I thought it necessary for the church, if it were not done, I would do it now, but this suppression will be my death. And we can read later on about what happened to the Pope, what actually happened to this Pope. So it says, Hence, all the avenues of approach to the Pope were carefully watched, and the utmost precautions employed to guard against the possibility of poison. These were successful for about eight months, when a peasant woman was persuaded by means of a disguise to procure entrance into the Vatican and offer to the Pope a fig in which poison was concealed. Clement was exceedingly fond of this fruit and he ate it without hesitation. The same day the first symptoms of severe illness were observed and to these rapidly succeeded violent inflammation of the bowels. He soon became convinced that he was poisoned and remarked, Alas, I knew he would poison me, but I did not expect to die in so slow and cruel a manner. His terrible sufferings continued for several months. When he died, the poor victim said, Carminian of the execrable Jesuits. So here we can read that that Pope was right. He knew it would be his death sentence doing that. So in, we read, in 1814, the Jesuits' suppression was brought to an end by Pope Pius he came out with a papal bull on August 7th, 1814, restoring the Jesuits. But by this point, the Jesuits had become stronger than they'd ever been. And we can actually read, we can read about the power of the Jesuit order by the early 18th century. This is from E. Boyd Barrett in 1926, and this is from the, Je the Jesuit Enigma book. It says, the Jesuit order at last reached the pinnacle of its power and prestige in the early 18th century. It had become more influential and more wealthy than any other organisation in the world. It held a position in world affairs that no oath-bound group of men has ever held before or since. Nearly all the kings and sovereigns of Europe had only Jesuits as directors of their consciences, so that the whole of Europe appeared to be governed by Jesuits only. So we can see by that quote the power that the Jesuits actually had running about this, this time. But later on in the 18th century, when we get to about 1860, the order did have some major setbacks and they suffered severe blows. The people of Europe were getting fed up with the Jesuits again and they began expelling them from their nations. And just to make things worse, the Pope had his temporal power took from him by King Victor Emmanuel of Italy. So we can read here from the book Vatican Assassins by Eric John Phelps on page 366. It says, By the 1860s, the Jesuits began to experience some serious setbacks, particularly at the hand of Protestant Germany. And then we can read from the same book, As a result of German victories during the War of 1870, Napoleon had to withdraw his French troops from Rome. They had protected the temporal power of the Pope since 1849. When the French withdrew, the Italians took Rome, creating the sovereign kingdom of Italy. The loss of the Pope's temporal power further enraged the Jesuits, as they blamed Germany's Kaiser Wilhelm and Prince Bismarck for it. So at this point, the Jesuits went to work. They went to work on devising a plan to restore the Pope as a universal monarch of the world, and also 
a plan to get back into these countries that had dared to banish them. So I hope you enjoyed it today, guys, and I'll see you in the next episode. Thanks for listening.